Good to see everybody this morning. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 5. Is this not working? Is this working? I can hear you close enough. James chapter 5. <clears throat> Hate to break up all that good fellowship. But I guess I will. <laughs> Uh, James chapter 5, we're up to about verse 17. Uh, looking at our announcements. Uh, of course, Eddie Shoemaker passed away. Uh, most of you know, most of you in here know him. Uh, we've got some that are kin to him. Wonderful man. I believe he was 101. 102. 102 years old, and every time I talk to him, I mean, I, I was just amazed at how sharp he, he still he was. Still sharp. Oh, man. What a wonderful man. Wonderful Christian man. Uh, of course, his sister, his sisters, Mary Emma and Gloria, both attended here. You're going to probably remember them. So let's keep that family in our prayers. Uh, Larry Rogers is in the hospital. What's uh, how is he this morning, Steve? Angie says he's some better, but he's not not well by any means. But he's he's high. they've been running IVs through him since Friday. Yeah. Got him hydrated. So they're running tests on him. He's had, just had an awful stomach virus. Okay. So Larry is. Uh, Dehydrated and he's getting fluid, so let's uh, let's remember him in our prayers. Uh, what about Roger Jones? Still no word. Okay. All right, and what's the word on Sam and Sarah? What's the latest? Does anybody know? Uh, I hadn't heard anything the past few days, so. Let's remember him. Steve Faulkner still uh, kind of touch and go, I think. Uh, anyone else? No one? All right, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly pray before you. We give you praise and glory for everything you bless us with. We're so thankful, Father, for you loving us and taking care of us. So thankful for this opportunity to meet together as your children. Pray, Father, that we will worship you in spirit and in truth and learn more about you and apply it to our lives in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. Pray, Father, that you'll, you'll be with all those just mentioned on our prayer list. Pray that you'll be with the Eddie Shoemaker family and comfort them as only you can. Pray that you'll be with Larry Rogers. Pray, Father, that he gets to feeling better as soon as possible and gets to go home. Pray that you continue to be with Roger Jones and Sam Becerra and Steve Faulkner. Pray that, Father, you'll be with each situation. Pray, dear Lord, that you'll be with all the civil unrest all throughout the world and the situations in, in Ukraine and Israel and Haiti. And now even Taiwan, just pray, Father, you'll be with all those situations and pray that you'll be with our leaders here and abroad. We pray for peace throughout the world. We love you and we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. We are in James chapter 5. And we are up to about verse 17. And my plan was, after we finished James, just to go right into First Peter. In case you're wondering, we may make it there this morning. So, uh, James 5, verse 17, says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, <clears throat> and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. 
So remember, this is right on the heels of verse 16 that says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So, and, and then he talks, you know, of course Elijah was a prophet. Don't get me wrong, but Elijah was still a man. Elijah was a, a man with a nature like ours. And see what his prayers accomplished. So, uh, what's the application for you and I? I think uh, the obvious application is that our prayers can be heard just like Elijah's can. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then he gives this example from Elijah. <clears throat> Any comments here? That kid out there would be the righteous man. Good point. The key part there would be the righteous man. Uh, what is it? Proverbs 28, verse 9 says, The one who refuses to hear the law, his prayers are an abomination. So, of course, that's Old Testament, but I think uh, to some degree that that principle still applies. Larry? Of course, we all know that the New Testament says the Old Testament was written for our learning. Uh huh. To face the God of the Spirit and not of hope. Elijah okay, here is the example of the regular guy who believes, even though God called him to something special. We all hold them and Abraham and David and all these guys in high esteem because of how God. He will give us the same blessing when we're the kind of people they are. It's who they work. It's not because God picked them out of their life's work. Right. Noah was, uh, uh, Noah walked with God. His wife, he found great in that. The Lord mm -hmm. read that verse that he walked with God. We walk with God, we're going to be taken care of and blessed with God. Good point. Good point. Anyone else? <clears throat> All right, verses 19 and 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. You know, how, how many of you have approached a fellow Christian and approached them for their sin and they didn't receive it well? Has that ever happened to you? Man, it's happened to me. <laughs> and uh, I've approached people before over their sin because of my love for them. And... It was not received well. Not received well at all. And uh, they didn't understand the love I had for them. Either that or they, their selfishness overrode that. I, I don't know. I, I don't, they, they, they took it as an attack. They took it as an attack on them did, and did not uh, feel my love for them. But... You know, that still shouldn't hinder us from approaching people we love and hoping they will repent. So, is it discouraging? It absolutely is. It'll, it'll break your heart. But it's still something that we need to do, isn't it? Larry? Well, Jesus does a lot of woe unto you. One of them is rather interesting. He said, woe unto you when all men well of you, for so did their fathers with the false prophets. And then uh, I heard a person say one time, if we're not careful, we would get into the mode that we would rather see our neighbor go to hell in a good humor than to tell the truth. Yeah. So we have to get our priorities straight now. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. Here's something about this. That you try to help somebody out sometimes and they just they get offended right off the bat. Yeah. It's, you can't, I don't know what you can do about it. I try, I try to 
be as gentle as possible, you know. Yeah. And get a point across, maybe one point across today, another point across tomorrow, something like that, work with them. But sometimes they just get offended. They don't yeah. want to hear it. I think, in a, I think in a lot of cases, though, it, especially if it's somebody that has fallen away from the church, it's it's their guilt that's making them lash out like that. Because most Probably. of the time, people know that yeah. they're doing it wrong. You know, yeah. especially like I said, if it's been if it's somebody that's been in the church and, and is out, right? Still shouldn't keep us from, like you said, should, should yeah. keep us from talking to them. It is discouraging, though. I mean, it'll it'll really just rip your insides out. Or you know, one of the context here is uh, is prayer. And, uh, and even if they're not listening to someone trying to talk to them, should keep us from praying for them. That's a good point. <clears throat> yeah. We should still pray for them, even if they won't receive, if they won't receive our uh, love. I mean, I don't know how else to say that. So just just keep praying for them. I think it's important to approach people in the right way. Some people have a little bit more skill than that than others. Yeah. People. So Paul talks to Timothy about that, first Timothy two. It's kind of like Second going to, two. I've heard, you know, people say, you know, we've all got different gifts. And, you know, some some Christians might should just stay away from the hospital. <laughs> might, might shouldn't go visit because, uh, you know, they might be the type of person Say, well, now what are you in here for? They tell them, so and so. Yeah, my uncle, my uncle died of that. <laughs> you know, maybe we shouldn't be there. <laughs> We're not skilled in that area. Uh, so I, some people are much, are better skilled at that. Yeah. Maybe I'm not very good at that sometimes. I, I don't know. Uh, I think it was Mark Twain that said, uh, some people bring joy wherever they go. Some whenever they go. <laughs> I think it was uh, For those that couldn't hear, watching at home, Wes said Mark Twain said some people, uh, he, and there's a quote from Mark Twain, he said some people bring joy wherever they go and some people bring joy whenever they go. <laughs> So that, that covers uh, the book of James. Notice, uh, I mean, what a way to end this book, though. I mean, you think about it. Think about all the good common sense all throughout this book. And then the end with this. I mean, I mean this, is, this is an awesome passage. Think about it. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, <coughs> And someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So even, even when we approach someone and it's not received well, just knowing that we could be saving a soul from death, we know we did it for the right reason. So don't let it discourage you. It's easy to get discouraged. Larry? There are a couple of places in the New Testament where it's pointed out. I know one of them is one of Peter's letters. Points out to the wife, says, whenever the husband cannot be won by the word, uh -huh. then you, yeah. you live a godly life in front of them, and maybe they will be won by that. With the implication that's not very close. Yeah. So that we can do. We can talk to them. And if they won't listen to that, then we live a Christian life, and they yeah. might and that, that's a good principle not, not only applies to the husband and wife that, that would apply to in, in any situation wouldn't it great point this also does away with one saved always saved too. sure it does because yeah. it wanders from the group yeah. back you know, that seems like they were once there I'm glad you brought that up I mean this, this shoots down once saved always saved uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of passages do, and this is one of them. So, so look as as you notice, verse twenty. We need to contemplate too. I think along the soul from death. You know, 
do we, I mean, do we really, do we ever, we think about souls dying and being in torment forever and ever and ever and ever? I mean, can you, I can't even, it's just, you know, you know, we, it's, something happens, you know, we might get over it, things might get better, but that's no, that's no, there's no change from, from that situation. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. But it's forever. We can't comprehend it. It's hard, it? Can we? No, I can't. I mean, I can't. You know, it's just, it's, 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 yeah. it scares you some. I mean, it should scare you, I guess, in a way. Yeah, you know, I've heard the, the illustration you got a mountain 10,000 feet high, and you got an eagle, and he's got this large sheet in his beak, and he flies over the top of that mountain dragging that sheep and he does this once a day every day for a million years and after a million years the mountain is ever so smaller he's wore down the mountain it's it's maybe a half inch shorter it's 9,999 feet and 11 and a half inches. I mean, he's knocked it down a half an inch in a million years. And he keeps doing this for millions of years and he finally levels the mountain down flat. And then you realize that the first second of eternity's clock has not yet ticked. That's how long eternity is. It's something we can't comprehend. No time. Yeah. We live in a time situation where there be no time. Yeah. After that, after the judgment, there be no time. Be no time. It's the point if man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. So, should that not encourage us to not only live godly lives ourselves, should that not encourage us to verse 20? Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death. And cover a multitude of sins. It should, it should. We shouldn't let a little bit of discouragement get in our way, should we? So, good thoughts, good point. Anyone else? So that that covers the book of James. And uh, it's often been called the New Testament Proverbs. And I, I think for good reason. Uh, there's just so much good stuff in here. I hope you've enjoyed our study of James. And, uh, and this is in what we call the general letters. Uh, of course, you got Paul's letters from uh, about 13 of them, from Romans through Philemon. No one's sure who wrote Hebrews, so it's kind of put right there in between Paul's letters and general letters. Uh, usually Hebrews is considered a general letter too, since we don't know for sure if Paul wrote it or not. But the general letters are, are Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude. They are written to general audiences. And... Uh, James was written to a general audience. So that takes us to 1 Peter. If you want to turn over to 1 Peter. And as you read 1 Peter and 2 Peter, even in English, it, it seems to be a, a different style. And a lot of, a lot of people really jump on that. And say uh, couldn't be the couldn't be the same author, and of course I believe that they're wrong. I believe there's always a logical explanation. They say the Greek that Art I know Art knows more about this than me, but the Greek First Peter is polished pretty good, and Second Peter is rough. They say Second Peter is uh, goes here, there, and yonder. There's not much structure to it. Well, when you consider that Peter was untrained, he was unlearned, um, 
they, they believe that, uh, you know, conservative scholars believe that he wrote Second Peter with his own hand because he, he was not a trained, he was not an educated man. Remember in Acts chapter 4, uh, about verses 8 through 13, when Peter and John are standing in front of the Sanhedrin council, that they, they spoke with boldness. Apparently they spoke with real good clarity. And, you know, of course, the Holy Spirit was in them. And it says that they, that the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, they were amazed at their boldness of, of Peter and John and that they were untrained and uneducated. That when they realized they were untrained and uneducated men, but they knew Jesus, they had been with Jesus, they were in awe. And Peter more than likely wrote Second Peter with his own hand, with no help. It's rough Greek. First Peter is polished. If you'll turn over to chapter 5, let's see if I can find the verse. Okay. Uh, start in verse 10. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By, by Silvanus, and that's another word for Silas, by Silas, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. Now he says here in verse 12 that he wrote this letter by Silas. Silas, uh, what do we know about Silas? He was with Paul. He was a traveling companion of Paul. He was a prophet. Uh, can't remember. Somewhere in Acts it says Silas was a prophet. Well, it, the obvious answer is Peter is inspired by the Holy Spirit. But Silas is putting the polishing touches of the Greek on here. And uh, I think it's just the obvious answer of how First and Second Peter is written by the same person, but they got different styles. Larry? As you pointed out a couple of times already, even though what is being said is inspired by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. it's the truth, I don't care who says it. Right. But the personality of the individual is definitely there because Paul is criticized for not being a good speaker. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Physical presentation, but what was written, I don't care if Paul did, James did, or right. whatever, that was inspired, it is still the Word of God. I've heard people sort of discount things because, well, now Paul said this, but Peter said that. Uh, no, yeah. God said all. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And, you know, you read, you read Paul's writings, you read John's writings. Completely different style. It, you know, it comes out in English, doesn't it? The, the, the Holy Spirit allows them to use their own personalities to convey the message. So I think that's important that we realize that. Uh, <clears throat> anyone else here before we start in 1 Peter? There were a lot of letters in the 2nd, 3rd centuries that were written by Peter and called Shudel Peter, but it's all shrouds. Uh -huh. Some of them uh, use other people's names, uh, hoping that uh, they would be accepted if they put Paul's name, or, right? You know, or yeah. Peter, and uh, that and some people, some people reject uh, second, second people rejected often, and I guess first people too. But they're, uh, they're, your liberals think that. Yeah. Well, and in case you couldn't hear, yeah. Art. There were a lot of false writings in the second and third centuries, and they would attach an apostle's name to them to get them to be accepted. And a lot of people, 
the liberal scholars today <clears throat> believe that that might be what happened to Second Peter. They don't believe Second Peter is inspired. They believe that it's a, a false writing and it, it's got too much stuff against once saved, always saved. They don't like that. And uh, I believe that God protected his word. And I believe we have the unadulterated, inspired word of God, every bit of it. And uh, I've, got, <clears throat> I've got lessons on uh, how the Bible uh, was compiled and there's no doubt that God was behind every bit of it. So don't, don't listen to a liberal uh, person on TV and tell you parts of the Bible are not inspired. I mean, we even, even talked about that. Some, uh, some of the reformers re rejected the book of James because it had stuff in there they didn't like. So they looked for any reason. I believe without the shadow of a doubt that everything that we possess today in the scriptures is from God. I mean, if God can create the, the world the way he did, he can preserve his word. He, you know, he, he did it. There's just no doubt. Did he? Are there books that were left out? No. Uh, the Apocrypha, there's a lot of things that were written in between the... the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, uh, Catholics have extra books in their Bible. I've read those through a couple of times. Some of those books are a good uh, history reference. Uh, in particular, one called First Maccabees. I, I, I really enjoy reading it. It's supposed to be historically accurate. Uh, It'll, it'll fill in a lot of blanks what happened between Malachi and Matthew. But the other books, I mean, they are, they're just, when you read them, there's just no doubt that there's not, they're not inspired. I believe without the shadow of a doubt that God's preserved his word. Larry? Well, yes, and everything that we have is all we need. Yes. There was a letter written to lay out of sins that we don't have. Mm -hmm. Right. But but we have everything that we need simply because mankind didn't preserve it or hadn't found it yet. But we do have enough for us to be a pleasing to God and understand his will for us with what we have. And Larry brings up a good point, you know, there there is a writing you know, apparently Laodicea received a letter. And a lot of, <clears throat> we don't have it today, but or do we? You know, some people think it may be the book of Ephesians. It could be because Ephesians and Colossians were wrote at the same time, sent at the same time. So is that what he's talking about? We don't know. But there's no doubt we've got everything we need. And if there is a if there is a letter out there separate called uh, you know Paul's letter to the Laodiceans, we don't have it because everything in it was already covered somewhere else. So we've got everything we need. There's just no doubt. Neil, Neil Pryor wrote a book called You Can Trust Your Bible. Oh, really? Yeah, I think, do you know that book, Art? I, th I think that's who wrote it. Neil Pryor but wrote that, a book called You Can Trust Your Bible. So that, <coughs> that might be a good one to look at. Um, Dad gave it to me, and I, and I read it. And, it. and it talks about kind of how the yeah. Bible was formed and everything. Re really interesting. Okay. Kind of good book. Good book to read is How We Got the Bible by Neil Lightfoot. <coughs> Neil Lightfoot, How We Got the Bible. It's, so It's written in, in uh, you know, it's easy to understand. It's written for the layman. Okay. Uh, and, uh, so good comments. It looks like we're out of time. So uh, thanks for your comments. And Lord willing, we'll start in First Peter chapter 1 next week.
Good morning. It's time to begin our services. I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to, uh, especially to welcome any guests that we have and let you know how much we appreciate you uh, taking your time to be with us here this morning and worship the Lord. And I'd like to uh, ask you to please feel free to come back and join with us in our services anytime you have an opportunity. If you'd stick around just a little while after services this morning, give us an opportunity to meet you and greet you and uh, let you know in a little bit more personal way how much we appreciate your attendance. For anyone that may have need of a nursery, we do have a nursery provided for you that is through the double doors to my left. There is a viewing window and a speaker in there so that you can still participate in the services. This time I'd like to ask everybody to Please take time to silence your cell phones or any electronic devices that could have some embarrassing interruptions during our service. The times of our services, every Sunday morning we meet at 9.30 for Bible study and worship service begins at 10.05. Sunday afternoon at 5.30 we return and Wednesday night at 7. Uh, tonight being an exception, we're going to have a, we're going to begin our services early at five o'clock, and then we're going to have a hay ride and some festivities following. If you'll follow along with me in the bulletin, our sympathy goes out to the family of Eddie Shoemaker. Eddie passed away Wednesday. Um, I'm not sure that it, um, if we've got any arrangements at this time. Uh, the uh, funeral is expected to be at the Phillips Funeral Home on October the 28th. Larry Rogers was admitted to the hospital uh, here at AMMC on Saturday. He's dehydrated and tests are being run. Prayers are requested for Roger Jones. That's Francis Dacus and Kathy Rosley's nephew. Uh, Debbie Gillian, Sam Bracera and Steve Faulkner. They are all facing health problems and uh, surgeries. Uh, as I mentioned, tonight our evening services will begin at 5 p.m. We'll have some extra time for a hayride and hot dog roast afterwards. Hot dogs and buns will be furnished, but please bring chili, chips, dips, drinks, desserts, uh, so that all the food groups are covered. Uh, and especially bring yourself if you can't even if you can't bring something to eat then uh, please join us we'll have plenty a wedding shower is planned for ty storms and maddie goins on sunday november the 5th at 2 p.m in our fellowship building next saturday we are planning a men's breakfast followed by work day uh, there will be more details to follow if you can attend then that would be great and the commissary pantry could use some uh, pancake mix, syrup, cake mix, and oatmeal. Uh, Sharon Rowe is not with us this morning. She's at home. She's not feeling well. Uh, apparently she caught what Charlie was suffering from. I have a card. It is addressed to the Commissary Church of Christ. Dear church family, Thank you for the cards, visit, texts, and phone calls during the loss of my mother, Frances Herring. It was greatly appreciated. Sincerely, Mary Storms. This is all the announcements that I have. Does anyone have anything that we may need to add? If not, those that will be leading our services this morning, Wes Wilkerson will be leading our singing. Uh, the speaker this morning will be Art Smith. At the appropriate time, Mark Rowe will lead us in a closing prayer, and at this time we have an opportunity and a blessing to be able to go to the Lord in prayer, and that will be led by Larry Lawson. Let's bow together. Father, we're privileged to be able to be here with, as your family this morning, to be with you as our Father, to be with Jesus, our older brother, and to be with these, our brothers and sisters that we live with here on earth. Father, it's a time of peacefulness, a time of encouragement, 
in a time of growing, and we're glad we can be part of it. Father, this morning we're sorry that some of our brothers and some of our sisters can't be here. We care about them. We know you do. So we just ask you to care for them, give them what they need. We know that you can do it. Father, it's good to have trust. And it's good to have trust in someone who can do it. And that's you. We're thankful, Father, that you care so much about us that you said you're going to take care of us. We believe that. And it makes us happy. We hope, Father, this morning that our being together will bring joy to you. That you will feel good about your children. That you will receive our honor and our worship and that you'll be happy with that. Help us as we encourage each other while together and help us all to accept encouragement in the right attitude. These things we offer, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.
you to turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1, the first chapter of the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. The title of uh, the lesson this morning is Nehemiah's Mission. And hopefully by looking at his mission, we can learn a little bit about what our mission should be. And we're going to be looking at the first couple of chapters of Nehemiah. And the first thing I want us to notice is the report to Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a captive in Babylon. And uh, he was a cupbearer for the king. And he received a report from a relative of his. And this is in Nehemiah, the first chapter, verses 1 through 3. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. They said to me, and here's the report, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Nehemiah 1 verses 1 through 3. Captives had been allowed to go back to the land of Israel in about 536 B.C. Different ones made the trip at, at different times. We know that in 457 B.C. that Ezra, the uh, prophet, the priest, uh, went back to read the law to them. This is about a dozen years later that Nehemiah gets this report from some of the men that had been to Jerusalem, had seen what was going on there, 
And Nehemiah just wanted to know how the people in Jerusalem were doing. And he says, if you look there at verse 3, the remnant, this is talking about the Jews that were there. They're in great distress and reproach. People today are in great distress and reproach. When Evan led us in prayer a few minutes ago before our class, he mentioned some places in the world that are experiencing distress and reproach. I think of Haiti because I've been there several times and I pray for Haiti every day and the congregation here has an interest in Haiti. We've been supporting Hope for Haiti's children for a number of years now. Ken Beaver was here recently to give us a report and update. There's a lot of civil unrest there. A lot of gangs that are attacking innocent people, kidnapping people, even killing people. It's not a safe place to be. God's people, Christians, are suffering as a result of it. And of course we think about Ukraine, the suffering that is taking place there as a result of the war. Many of your brothers and sisters live in Ukraine. There has been a lot of missionary efforts made. People have been converted to the Lord. They're suffering from the war that's there. And if you've had the news on the last couple of weeks, then you know about Israel, what's going on there. And you have brothers and sisters in Israel. And we worry about them. And of course, right here in America, there are people that are in distress for various reasons. And we need to think about them. And then the second part of the report was that the wall in Jerusalem had been broken down. And of course, this allowed the enemy to come in, took down their protection, took down their security. People worried about that. Some churches today are in distress, so to speak, wall has been torn down. And I don't know about you, but I worry about that. I worry about our congregation. Hopefully we can work hard to bring our numbers back up where they were a year or so ago, maybe a few years ago. Some families are in disarray. Walls have been torn down. Maybe financially, emotionally, certainly spiritually. We worry about them. And then another part of the report was that the gates have been burned. Well, the gates weren't much use because the walls have been torn down. This is just part of how susceptible they were to dangers outside the city. Probably were a number of causes for this. They had enemies. They had people that did not want the Jewish people to be there, did not welcome the captives back to the land of Israel, did everything they could to keep them from succeeding. Uh, when they first came back, it was for the purpose of rebuilding the temple and they had enemies, enemies that uh, interfered. The rebuilding uh, took a little vacation of about 15 years when no one did any work on the temple. Haggai and Zechariah were raised up by God to encourage the people to get back, rebuild the temple, which they did and finish 516 BC. But probably even a bigger cause of what was going on in Jerusalem was pure neglect. People were no longer 
reading their Bible. No longer going to the temple to worship. No longer heeding what God had given them. Neglect. Sometimes when we are in distress, the cause is beyond our control. You may be experiencing distress right now. Maybe it's a spiritual matter. Maybe you haven't relied upon God as much as you should, and all of us can relate to that, I think. But it could be that the cause is beyond your control. That's often the case. Times like that, we just need to rely that much more on God, who is in control. And we need to remember that. But you have, first of all, that report to Nehemiah. Things are not going well back in the homeland. People are distressed. The walls are torn down. The gates are burned. Not a pretty picture. Not a pretty picture. Secondly, I want us to notice the request of Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah was going to go to the king and he was going to make a request. But I want us to look at what he did before he made the request to the king. Look at verse 4 here in chapter 1. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He wept over the city of Jerusalem. Jesus, some 400 years later, would weep over the same city. He knew what was coming. He knew that the Romans would march through the city and destroy it. They would tear down the temple. They would kill innocent people. He looked over the city and he cried. Matthew 23, verse 37. And when Nehemiah thought about his brethren in Jerusalem, he mourned over their situation for days. He fasted, probably did not feel like eating, spending his time crying, mourning. But I want you to notice, it's not enough to cry. It's okay to cry. But he prayed. Look at verses 5 through 11 here in chapter 1. I said, this is Nehemiah speaking, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant, loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances, which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the people. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion 
before this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king, he says. I think about Jesus when he was about to choose the men that would be his apostles in Luke chapter 6. The Bible says in Luke 6 and verse 12 that he spent all night in prayer. Can you imagine praying that long? That was an important decision. Nehemiah was about to make an important request and he prayed. I think about people who assembled together in Acts chapter 1 after Jesus had died, been resurrected, and had ascended back to heaven. It was necessary to appoint a new apostle, someone to take the place of Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed Jesus and had later committed suicide. They gathered together to make that decision, and in Acts 1 verse 24, the Bible says they prayed. They prayed. In Acts 13, we read where Paul and Barnabas were sent out on that first missionary journey. Their sponsoring congregation was the church at Antioch of Syria. And before they sent them out, the Bible says, Acts 13 and verse 3, they prayed. They prayed. We've looked at a verse in James 5 in our auditorium class here on Sunday morning. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. James 5 and verse 16. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. You've heard that verse, haven't you? 1 Timothy 5 or 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. That doesn't mean that we go around just, you know, muttering all the time. It means to have the attitude of prayer. Be ready to pray at any and all times. I came to Arkansas in 1965. Came here with the Herschel Johnson family. Herschel had been in Idaho for 10 years preaching the gospel. Family decided to move back to Arkansas. They told me about Crowley's Ridge College and I decided that I would like to go there. And When they got ready to come back, I got in the car and came with them. But I remember the night before we left, our family had gone to Herschel's house and I was going to uh, bring them my suitcase so that they could pack it and be ready for the morning when we'd leave. And while we were there, the elders of the congregation where Herschel had been serving came over. We all formed a circle and they prayed for Herschel and his family as they left Idaho to come back. One of the trips that I've made there, a friend of mine called me on the phone. He said, can I come over and see you? I said, yes. He came, handed me some money, said, I want you to use this in Haiti. You'll find a need for it. And then he prayed with us that the mission would be successful and that God would be with us. So Nehemiah, before he ever made this request to the king, prayed. Of course, he wept and he mourned, but he didn't leave out prayer. As he says here, he's a cupbearer to the king. A cupbearer the cupbearer's responsibility was to taste the wine before it was given to the king. If it was poisoned, then he would die and the king would be spared. Very responsible position, very important job. And look at the king's question here in, in uh, Nehemiah the uh, second second chapter look at verses two and three so the king said to me why is your face sad though you are not sick this is nothing but sadness of heart 
then I was very much afraid. You did not show sadness around the king. He could have you put to death. He had the power of life and death over you. Nehemiah understood that. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? Then look at verse 4. Then the king said to me, What would you request? What is your request? What do you want? And notice the, the last phrase there in verse 4. So I prayed to the God of heaven. He prayed again. Again, the power, the importance of praying. Now I want us to look at the request that he makes. Verses 5 through, five through 9 here in chapter 2. I said to the king, If it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, Send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. The, the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. And I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river, that they may allow me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress which is by the temple, for the wall of the city, and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me, because the good hand of my God was on me. Then I came to the governors of the provinces beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king has sent me with officers of the army and horsemen. So you see the request of Nehemiah. Now, third point. I want us to look at the research of Nehemiah. And this is in verses 11 through 15. They make the journey. They, they get there. But Nehemiah wants to look over the situation. Look at verse 11 then through 15. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I rose in the night, I and a few men with me. I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem. And there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. So I went out at night by the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's well, and on to the refuge gate, inspecting the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down, and its gates which were consumed by fire. Then I passed on to the fountain gate, and to the king's pool, and there was no place for my mount to pass. So I went up at night by the ravine and inspected the wall. Then I entered the valley gate again, and returned. He found out that the report that had been given to him was absolutely right on. But he had to go look and view for himself. He had that first hand view. Whenever the children of Israel came to the land of Palestine, Moses sent 12 spies into the land that flowed with milk and honey. This is in Numbers 13. And it was their job to look at the land, see what was there, what obstacles were in the way, to see if it was a land that flowed with milk and honey. Now Nehemiah doesn't see milk and honey when he comes to Jerusalem several hundred years later. He sees a city in ruins, walls broken down, gates burned people that are in distress. But he did find out that the report was true. He did his research. I think that whenever the 
church decides to do a mission work, they should do the research. Whenever they decide to help individuals that are asking for help, it's always wise to do some research. Nehemiah did this. Then our final point here, I want us to notice the response to Nehemiah. Look at chapter 2, verses 16 through 20, beginning at verse 16. The officials did not know where I'd gone or what I'd done. Lord, had I as yet told the Jews, the priests, nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work, then I said to them, you see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then they said, let us rise up and build. So they put their hands to the good work. But when Samuel with the Hornite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, What is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. And so, there was opposition. But I want you to know, and you are familiar with the story probably, that they achieved their purpose. They rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And they did that in amazing time. 52 days, according to Nehemiah 6 and verse 15. Because the response was there. Whenever he laid it out before the people, they said, let us rise up and build. Would be to God that his people today would have a response similar to that. I'm glad to be a part of a congregation where I see that attitude and have seen it time after time over the past 40 years and believe that I will see that in the future. What is our response? What is your response this morning? Could be you're not even a child of God. What is your response to the offer that he gives you to be his child so that you can go to heaven when you die? What is your response? To those of you that have uh, obeyed God, and that's a good portion of you, what is your response to the challenge of the Great Commission? Jesus said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. What is your response to that? You say, well, if I could go to Haiti, I would. If I go to Africa, I would. If I go to South America, I would, but I can't. Part of the world is Greene County, Arkansas. Part of the world are our neighbors and friends and our loved ones. We can share the gospel with them. Are we going to rise up and meet the challenge? I love the book of Nehemiah. He spent a dozen years in Jerusalem, became the governor, then eventually went back to Babylon. But he was there on a mission. We're only here for a short period of time. No one of us is going to be here very long. We mentioned the great Christian Eddie Shoemaker, been on this earth for more than 100 years. 100 years still is not very long. No one of us will be here 
a long time. Time is of essence, so we need to rise up and meet the challenge in much the same way that Nehemiah and his fellow workers did when they were called to come back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. There are walls that need to be rebuilt. There are gates that need to be restored. We're not dealing with brick and mortar here, but we're dealing with the souls of men and women. We always need to be ready to rebuild. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down the weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found Thank you. 
Today is the first day of the week, and follow the example that we had from the first century church. We know that they took communion every first day of the week. Pray with me, please. Almighty Heavenly Father, we come to you to commune with you on the first day of the week to thank you for your sacrifice that was made on our behalf, for sacrificing your body. You could, have, you could have called 12 legions of angels to come down and save you off that cross, but you chose because of your love for us to stay on that cross and do the will of the Father. This bread represents your body and your life, and you are the bread of life. We thank you for all that you've done for us and the way you do it. And thank you for following the will of the Father, being a perfect example for the rest of us. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you, Father, for your sacrifice. And this is our prayer we offer up to you in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Once again, dear Lord, as we surround thy table and we are about to take the cup, the cup of which represents thy bloodshed, dear Lord, let us remember the pain and suffering on the cross that you did for all our sins. Dear Lord, as we take of this cup, this cup, let us do it in remembrance of thee. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen.
we find this to be a convenient time to give back as we've been prospered. Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for this opportunity that you give us, that you let us have to give back to you. Help us to do so with a gracious heart, not begrudgingly, and we just ask that what we give be used in a way pleasing to you. And these things we ask. Attendance this morning was 158. I want to welcome back any visitors that we might have, and please remember that our services begin at 5 instead of 5 30. Let's stand and we'll sing the first version of number 248. And that's this song that led our closing. <coughs> 248. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith. It is excellent work. What more can he say than to you he has said, you who unto Jesus for refuge and fled? Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for everything that you do for us. We praise you. We're so thankful that we get together and can get together like we do and, and worship you. Lord, we ask that the lessons that were taught here today can be, be taken in by each one of us, and the result will be that we'll be better people, better Christians. We're now, as we separate from this place, we ask that you will continue to look after each, each of us and forgive us as we sin, Lord. All of this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> 